OPGW Engineering. So we refer to this as Engineering 301 because we're beginning to get into more advanced topics related to OPGW Engineering. Today, we're gonna to be talking about installation that had come up recently and seemed to be a topic of interest. So I decided uh, to do today's webinar on that subject. First, this is a RCEP compliant course. So the Registered Continuing Education Program. So if you would like to get uh, credits, professional development hours or continuing education credits, you can do so. The way you'll do that is at the end, there will be, uh, or after the, after the class, we will send you an email and in the email will be a link to where you can go and take a test. If you pass the test with 70%, then you will earn credit for this class. If this is a one hour class, so you will get, you got it, one hour. So important points about this, uh, and we will issue those credits through the RCEP website. And so they'll keep a record of your credits for however long they keep a record of your credits. And this is not to be construed as RCEP, RCEP endorsing or otherwise approving the content here. I will comment that we try to make the course of general interest, and I will talk about in the, during the course differences between the way uh, InCab approaches installation and the way some other cable manufacturers will approach it and help you understand what we do and why. And uh, that can give you a foundation for talking to those other companies to understand what they do and why, uh, which is a little bit different from what we do. So this course is about installing OPGW. We are only going to be discussing stringing today. There's really two parts of installation. There's stringing and there's splice prep. And so splice prep, we will do another day, another course. So another opportunity to earn another hour. So you can see some of the topics we will be discussing in here. And here are our specific learning objectives. Give everybody a minute to review these. I think that's pretty good. And before continuing, uh, please save questions for the end. Often during these webinars, we've had panelists to be able to help with the answers. Well, actually, yes, we do today as well. So you can, during chat, submit questions. But at the end, there will also be a question and answer session, and you have the ability to submit questions at the end. So kind of either way, if uh, one of the panelists can't answer your question during the presentation, then I will uh, do my best to answer it at the end. Okay, the rules for today are, we've already done the installation and sound check. The presentation itself is gonna take about 60 minutes. Uh, I already mentioned about the chat for questions. Uh, however, questions should be uh, technical questions only. So we don't wanna talk about business. Like if you've got a, an order in progress with us and some issue about that, let's try to make it technical questions of general interest. And before continuing, I do wanna mention that we do have our learning hub on our website where you can find uh, posts to information of general interest of various topics, splice prep, I believe there's also posted there uh, links to previous uh, uh, webinars that we've given. And that's enough of that. Let's get started. So I said today we're talking about stringing. And I wanna begin with a very important point, which is safety. Uh, 
there is nothing in today's presentation that is in, intended to override any applicable federal, state, local industry or your own company's safety rules and practices. So you have to follow all of those things when you're shipping, handling, storing, and stringing your own GW. And of course, you also need to be cognizant that the safety needs of the general public and your own personnel supersede any other consideration. So nothing that I say today is intended to in any way supersede any proper safety procedures that you or your company or the government has. So when we talk about installation and stringing, one of the first things you're going to have to do is pick up and move the reel to the site where you're installing it. So we want to quickly review proper reel handling. So here with the green check marks are things that you are supposed to do. And the most important ones are that you should always lift a reel from the side if you're using a forklift and from the bottom. And it's absolutely critical that the forks go from one flange, so one side of the reel to the other flange, the other side of the reel. Always, always, always. The little drawings that we have here depict a reel that's got wood lagging on it. One of my uh, observations in life is that forklift drivers often think that the wood lagging is able to support the full weight of the reel. And that is absolutely, totally incorrect. The wood lagging is really there just to protect from impact and environmental damage. That's it. It cannot support the full weight of a reel, typically, especially not a heavy one. So if they do not make sure that the forks go flange to flange and they try to lift the reel, uh, the wood lagging will break and that could damage the cable and then everybody has a bad day. So with a forklift, absolutely critical that the forks go flange to flange. Never do the things that you see here with the forklift. I'll just mention what you see here with the forklift in the center. That's really a metal reel, uh, a wood reel. You wouldn't be able to go through the center. Uh, uh, but even with a metal reel, you want to be lifting from the bottom, as you see on the pictures on the left, not through the center. If you're using a crane or a similar mechanism, you always want to use a steel lifting bar and a steel axle. So you've got an axle that goes to the arbor hole uh, on the reel. Again, at minimum flange to flange. Actually, of course, you need more to connect to it. And then you've got a lifting bar above that. What you don't want to do in particular is what you see here in this picture with the lifting bar and somebody has put a strap through the arbor holes. Uh, that's not a good practice. First of all, it'd be kind of hard to thread that strap through. But then when you go to lift the cable, this strap is going to be causing the flange to kind of bend. It's going to bend in on the top and bow out in the bottom that can cause the cable wind to shift and then that can cause bad things uh, specifically if the cable wind loosens up too much then when you go to string the cable the cable will have a tendency to pull down to a lower la layer and if that happens that can get the cable stuck and then bad things happen and everyone has a bad day a variation of this theme is what you see over here where somebody has wrapped a, a strap through the arbor holes and just up to like a hook on a crane or something that's even worse than what i talked about a moment ago because that's really going to put a lot of pressure on the top of the reel and by extension make the bottom want to bow out more again possibly shifting the cable wind and then that can show up as a problem during the stringing process. Not a good practice. So always, always, always use both an axle and a lifting bar if you're using a crane or some, some such mechanism. Reels should always be stored upright. So never put a reel on its flange. It's important because they're round and they can roll that you chalk them. 
piece of wood is fine, whatever you got handy. Uh, it is okay to roll reel in a smooth uh, surface. So if you're in, say, a warehouse or in the parking lot of a, a service center, maybe, it's okay to roll a reel short distances on a smooth, flat surface, short distances. But obviously, if you're out in the field, uh, you don't want to be rolling a reel, say, you know, half, half a mile down the dirt road in the hinterlands of the United States somewhere. Not a good practice. Okay, so real handling is important and that begins the process. The next thing that you need to be aware of is that you need to have a copy of the cable data sheet with you when you're doing the installation. It has important information. I'm only going to discuss the basics, but there's important information on the data sheets, anybody's data sheet. So some cable suppliers are going to tell you like all of the shiv sizes that you should use, for example, and bull wheel diameters and things like that. There's important information on that data sheet, regardless of whose cable uh, it is. This data sheet is actually one of ours, and I just want to illustrate that two of the most basic pieces of information that you need to know are the cable diameter and the cable rated breaking strength. If you don't have that data sheet, when you go to string a cable, you need to go contact the cable manufacturer and get it, either directly or through their local sales rep, but get a copy of the data sheet. And I'm gonna show you how you're gonna use this information in just a moment. To begin with, you've got, aha, I skipped a slide. You have to check the poll. This is sort of your last chance. Now, what we're about to review should have already been done during the design process, but it's worth a double check before you actually start stringing to make sure that you're not gonna have a problem. Uh, specifically, the things that you're looking for is that the pull cannot exceed the maximum pull in tension of the cable. Now, here in the United States, per the IEEE 1138 standard, and also 524, as a matter of fact, uses the same number. It's 20% of the rated breaking strength of the cable. That's why you need that cable data sheet because you gotta know what that rated breaking strength is so that you know this number. You also need to check and make sure that the maximum horizontal line angle change is okay. And we'll talk about that in a few slides. Let's look at these concepts. So back to the cable data sheet again, this is where you're gonna get that rated breaking strength. It's very straightforward in math to calculate that maximum pull in tension. It's 20% of whatever that rated breaking strength is. Now, to calculate the maximum pull in tension, there's a couple methods to do that. Both of them are in IEEE 524. I like to use the one that I show here. It's very simple and straightforward, but you can find an alternate implementation of, of what's in 524 on the Wagner Smith uh, website. The concepts are very similar. They're just looking at it from say a slightly different angle, so to speak. Um, you're making similar assumptions about how much sag you're gonna have in the cable, for example. So you'll get the same answer if you, wh whichever method you use. So just use the one you like. But what I'm going to do is use this method. So the tension at the payoff, which is the cable reel, is generally going to have to be about half the design tension at 60 degrees Fahrenheit initial, no ice, no wind. As you pull the cable, uh, down a line through pulling shivs, the tension is going to increase at, a, at each stringing block. And there's a formula to help you estimate that. So that maximum tension from the pulling end is going to be this tension at the payoff divided by 0.98 raised to the N. N is the number of structures. And what this means is 0.98 is an assumed efficiency for each stringing block. 
So in other words, each stringing block is 98% efficient. Do you really know that? No, um, but it's a pretty good number. And this formula is useful for telling you when you might have an issue. So 0.98 raised to the number of structures because each stringing block adds a little bit of friction uh, in the pull, which in turn is increasing the tension as the pull progresses. So an example of how this works, if I was pulling 19,500 feet through 30 structures with a cable that had a rated breaking strength of 20,000 pounds, and the design tension, so this 60 degrees Fahrenheit initial no ice, no wind tension was 3,000 pounds. Uh, the estimated tension at the payoff would be 1,500 pounds. So that's half this design tension. And the estimated maximum tension would be 1 over 0.98 raised to the 30. And that works out to 1.8. So 1.8 times 1,500, that's 2,700 pounds. That's less than 20% of the rated breaking strength, which is 4,000 pounds. So you're okay, everything is fine. Uh, usually you start to get into trouble, not really trouble, but concern for sure, above about 35 structures. It's somewhere between 35 and 40 structures this gets to be about a factor of two and relative to your design tension, it works out such that you're gonna risk exceeding this 20% uh, rated breaking strength limit. Now, how many angles can you pull through? And this is in CAB's guidelines. So, and by the way, they are just guidelines. This is not some kind of a law. What it's intended to do is to, if, if you get tripped up on this, it's supposed to alert you that you need to have a conversation with the cable manufacturer. These are good limits. Uh, poles that exceed it sometimes have trouble. Um, poles that exceed it when the customer has come to me and we've planned the pull together, have not had problems. The longest pull that I've successfully completed in my career was 31,000 feet. Uh, I used these same guidelines here. That was a couple decades ago. Um, so they really do work. For center tube type designs, so a plain center stainless steel loose tube or an aluminum clad center stainless steel loose tube, or an aluminum pipe type design with plastic buffer tubes, you want to keep that total horizontal line angle change less than 270 degrees if you can, of which one can be greater than 90 degrees. For a fully stranded stainless steel loose tube design, you want to keep that total horizontal line angle change less than 360 degrees if you can, of which two can be greater than 90 degrees. Now, again, these are guidelines, not laws. So if you get tripped up on this, you should contact the cable manufacturer and they should be able to help you out. That 31,000 foot pole that I did, the total line angle change was 540 degrees. So again, it, this is not a strict limit. It's intended to say, to throw up a yellow flag, to say, let's look at this closely and plan very carefully. And incidentally, you can ignore angles that are less than five degrees. Once again, other manufacturers could be more or less restrictive. You do need to check, um, but these are good guidelines because at the end of the day, really cable is cable. They still give you insight, even if you're not working with uh, in cab cable. Now, for actually pulling in the cable, there is one and only one method to use, and that is the controlled tension stringing method. This is dis also discussed in IEEE 524. It's also what's typically used for conductors. There are other methods, but I'm not even going to mention them today because I don't even want to put their names in your mind. I want you to only think about controlled tension stringing. Uh, this method consists of using a bullwheel tensioning device at the payoff end. 
in order to maintain constant cable tension during the stringing. Uh, we'll look at the overall method and we'll look at the particular pieces of equipment as we continue. The overall method looks like what you see here. So you have a cable reel and the tensioning device on the payoff side. You go through your stringing blocks and you have a pulling uh, machine on the other side. You see here other dimensions, the run on the payoff side and the rise of the payoff side. We'll discuss that later. In this particular um, illustration, there is an anti-rotation device that's shown. We'll talk about that later. But you get the con you get the concept here. This may or may not be required, the ARD that is. So to begin with, you've got a bull wheel tensioner. Uh, the bull wheel tensioner has to be capable of maintaining constant tension and speed. The grooves need to be neoprene lined and in excellent condition. That means they're clean with no scratches, gouges, or grooves worn into the surface. The test I've used for a long time is what I call the mental bloody hand test, because remember, it's mental because remember safety at the beginning, right? So if you do this with your real hand, and it's bloody, that's on you, because I told you, you can't violate your company's safety requirements or any other safety requirements. So it's a mental test only. But basically what you would do is put your hand in the groove and imagine that if that groove turned and if your hand would come out a bloody mess, you know that that groove is not good for use with the cable that you're trying to install. Now, OPGW in the United States is left-hand lay. Conductor is right-hand lay. In theory, the reeving of the bull wheels should be the opposite. Uh, I realized a few minutes before this webinar that I had not included an illustration of that. So I quickly improvised. Here's a uh, crude picture. Uh, I shouldn't say it's that crude because I took it directly from IEEE 524. So the reeving for a right lay conductor would go left to right. With OPGW, in theory, it should go right to left. I say in theory because I've seen equipment in the field that did not have the capability of going right to left. It was physically impossible the way the equipment was designed. With OPGW, I have never seen that cause a problem. In theory, you want it to be opposite, but if you can't do it, talk to the manufacturer, the cable manufacturer about that. I would generally allow it. The reason is that left to right is important for conductor because the outer strands of conductor are 1350 aluminum, which is relatively soft and ductile, especially compared to the aluminum clad steel, which is quite strong and not very ductile, and the aluminum alloy, which is 6201, that's used in OPGW, which is substantially stronger and less ductile than the 1350 used on conductor. So for those reasons, I think it is okay, not critical, to change the reeving for OPGW. But again, other manufacturers may not allow that uh, difference. Uh, I would. If you can do it, do it. If you can't, contact the cable manufacturer. The reel stand obviously must be capable of supporting the gross weight of the reel. It needs to rotate smoothly so that the cable pays off smoothly. You're going to hear the word smooth about a thousand times in the course of this presentation because a pull going smoothly is absolutely a cr uh, critical, and we'll talk about it more later. Now, you want to have constant light back tension on the reel as the cable is paying off. And you'll find in our instructions 50 to 100 pounds of back tension, which really means hand tight. So that means that if the cable is going to the bull reel, you should be able to kind of tug on it and you should feel some resistance in the cable, some resistance. It shouldn't feel like you're working on a banjo string 
But at the other hand, it shouldn't be all loosey goosey either. Uh, I forgive forgive me for using these highly technical terms here, but uh, I think you get the idea. And the underlying concept is really this, no free spin. So if the pole has to stop, you don't want the reel to keep uh, rotating. If that happens, the wind is gonna loosen. And again, we're back to bad things happening and people having a bad day. So the real point is no free spin, hand tight. The puller obviously has to have sufficient working capacity to pull, right? If, if you've estimated the maximum tension is going to be, what did we have before? Uh, 2,700 pounds, obviously the puller needs to be capable of pulling at least 2,700 pounds. Uh, it obviously needs to have sufficient volume for the pulling line. Most importantly is it needs to operate smoothly. There's that word again. So you don't want any chatter, right? So the cable's kind of vibrating, again, like a banjo string or a guitar, um, you know, kind of going up and down more than alien vibration, but less than galloping, say. Uh, you don't want any of that. And you, of course, you also don't want any sudden jerking or bouncing of the cable. Needs to be capable of operating smoothly. Next up, the pulling rope or pulling line. Uh, a braided pulling rope with no torque is the best. It should be about the same diameter as the OPGW and obviously it needs to have sufficient strength, right? So again, if the pole is about 3000 pounds that you've estimated, you wanna make sure that your pulling line has at least that much strength. Now, I often get asked about using an existing shield wire to pull in OPGW. And yes, that can be done, but there are a lot of uh, cautionary aspects that you need to consider. First, is that shield, existing shield wire, is it gonna survive being pulled out, right? Because if it breaks, your cable's new cable is gonna go crashing to the ground and everybody's gonna have a bad day. So you have to inspect that existing shield wire before the pull, but visually, can you really tell much? I don't know, that's debatable. You can use d drones and Connectrix and some other companies have uh, assessment equipment uh, like Connectrix uses an X-ray mechanism where you can assess the condition of a conductor uh, to include a, a, an existing shield wire to confirm that it's in good condition. What you're looking for is also any broken strands or substantial corrosion because again, if the cable breaks during pull-in, everybody's gonna have a bad day. Even if it passes this inspection, you've still gotta to continue to monitor it during the pull because once you're increasing the attention on that existing cable, then you could break strands at that point. And broken strands can cause damage to the shivs, which in turn can transfer to the OPGW. Not a good situation. So I gotta respond to you when you ask me, what about using an existing shield wire and say, is it really worth the risk? Again, from a safety standpoint and considering the investment that your company just made in a new OPGW cable, I argue that it's better to use the existing cable to maybe pull in a, a new pulling rope. The pulling rope is gonna be a lot lighter. Uh, so that means the tension uh, increase uh, is gonna be lower than if you're trying to use the shield wire to pull in OPGW. Uh, and the consequences of a problem uh, are thereby uh, mitigated if you use the existing shield wire to pull in your pulling rope and then use your pulling rope to pull in your OPGW. That's my recommendation. But if you absolutely wanna do this, you can do it, but you gotta be very careful. Next up, your pulling grips. Uh, you must use high quality woven wire pulling, woven wire pulling grip. Uh, people commonly call this a Kellams type grip. You want it, uh, you need at least one size for the OPGW. You may need a slightly different size for the pulling rope. Often though, they're gonna be about the same size. So they'll, you can use the same group, same grip uh, for either. 
it obviously needs to be strong enough for the pole and it needs to pass freely through the block. So this is a typical uh, Kellen script. It is a good idea to duct tape over the grip, uh, you know, just so the, the, the metal isn't doing anything to the stringing blocks. Next up, swivel. Swivel is really important because the swivel is going to isolate any torque on the pulling rope from any torque that's on the cable, the OPGW, I mean. It needs to be strong enough for the pull, and then this one is really important. It has to pass freely through the blocks. If you're not careful, the swivel could be too big and not pass freely through your stringing box. You have to pay particular attention to make sure that it will pass freely through the stringing blocks. Now in the illustration down here, we have OPGW with that pulling grip going to a swivel, another pulling grip, and then your pulling line. So in, obviously this must be a stranded stainless steel tube type OPGW because there's no anti-rotation device here. Uh, if there were, um, it would be in, in here. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Stringing blocks, also called shivs, travelers, pulleys, they all mean the same thing. Your stringing blocks are the single most important tool used during the stringing process. It's absolutely essential that they rotate freely and that they have a smooth, clean bearing service. So remember that mental bloody hand test same thing applies here. If you would be afraid to put your hand in this groove and rotate this block because you think that your hand would come out a bloody mess, then you know that that's not a good block to use. Now, in my experience, unlined aluminum blocks work great, as in they work the best. I prefer them based on my years of field experience. However, some manufacturers don't approve of unlined blocks being used on their cable. Uh, they prefer lined blocks. In theory, lined blocks with neoprene and urethane are okay. We do allow it, but in my experience, uh, I've had more problems with poles where there's been line blocks than with unlined blocks, aluminum blocks. And in particular, when there's been a problem, I've told customers to change to using unlined blocks and the problems have gone away. The reason is that the, uh, the, the lining can give friction to the cable and that friction can allow the cable, because remember OPGW tends to be relatively small and light compared to conductor. So that means that that friction can give the cable a tendency to ride up trying to get out of the groove. It doesn't always succeed. It may climb a little bit and then fall back, but that fallback might create some twist in the cable, which is rotation, which you've been trying to avoid in the cable. And this is especially true at angles. So you have to be careful. And this too, again, you have to check with the manufacturers. But if you're working with my cable, I'm going to tell you I prefer the unlined aluminum blocks. If you're going to use lining, I slightly prefer urethane over neoprene. Not that there's anything bad with neoprene in and of itself, but it seems like when it's used in blocks, it's a little bit more frictiony than urethane. And that friction is what can allow the cable to climb out of the block. The urethane tends to be harder and slicker, so less possibility of coming out of the blocks. If you can only buy one block and you need the lining for like your conductor or because you also might be using somebody else's cable, not just limiting yourself to NCAB, then I would probably have a slight preference to tell you to buy urethane blocks. So be careful, uh, we are available if you need help in this area. And again, some manufacturers will only allow lined blocks, but what everybody agrees on is never ever use unlined steel blocks. 
never, ever, ever. Only if you're using unlined blocks, they have to be aluminum. Now today, uh, there's also another option, newer option, which is a plastic block. This comes from one particular company. They only have a very limited number of sizes. Their 24 inch size is a very versatile size though, and can be used for most OPGW at most angles. You do have to check some cables that are a little bit large or some angles in some situations. These might not be suitable, but I really like them. Uh, they're light which means at angles they'll float better with the cable as the pull progresses. Uh, but as I say, the, uh, you do got to check the details on this. Sizing of blocks. So for your first, last, and any angles greater than 45 degrees, if you've got an aluminum pipe type OPGW or a center tube type OPGW, center tube meaning stainless steel loose tube, whether plain or clad with aluminum, you need 40 times the cable diameter. So if I had a cable that's a half inch, I need a block where the groove root diameter, bottom of groove to bottom of groove is 20 inches. For a stranded stainless steel loose tube design, that figure changes to 30 times cable diameter. So again, the half inch uh, cable, if it was a stranded type design, you could use a 15 inch bottom of groove diameter stringing block. So at all other structures, which really means your ta tangent structures in particular, but of course any angle, uh, less than 45 degrees. For the aluminum pipe type and the center tube type designs, you need to use 35 times cable diameter. And for the stranded stainless steel loose tube type, you need to use 25 times cable diameter. And again, remember, this is bottom of groove dimensions, not your overall dimension. So like uh, a block, a block manufacturer will say it's a 36 inch block, but the actual bottom of groove diameter of a 36 inch block, I believe is about 30 inches. So significant uh, difference, um, especially as the block diameter gets larger. And again, I have to warn you, some manufacturers may be more restrictive, especially for the stranded stainless steel loose tube design. So you do have to check. I don't think anybody requires more than 40 times diameter though. I don't think so. At angles over 30 degrees, you have to support the blocks. Now remember here, it's 45 degrees affects size, but support kicks in at 30 degrees. And what you're looking for, I should say, what you don't want is the block and the OPGW out of plane. So they need to be in the same plane together, ideally like you see in this picture here. So that groove diameter lines up with the cable. When you have this situation that you see in the red, the cable is going to be tending to try to ride up out of this groove and potentially drag along the frame and that's really bad. Now this is a static support and this is a static support and the tension can change during the pull. So ideally you'd like for the cable block to float. And you can do that by rigging up a pivot point as you see here. This was something that I was first introduced to by Florida Power and Light many, many moons ago. A little bit more complicated, but it works nicely. Uh, if this is rope uh, or chain, you'll get some float in this configuration. Obviously, this one is static. Um, it's better if you can get some float. This does require some experience because before the pull, the OPGW, or the pulling line, I should say, is likely to be below the plane. But then when everything gets uh, under tension, it's going to tighten up and be in plane but it takes some experience to figure out how much offset 
you need before you begin the pull. Um, and that's why if you can, floating is actually best. Now, there are blocks that you should never, ever, ever use. The number one thing that I have seen screw up cable in the field is blocks that were too small or what you see in these pictures. And particularly blocks that look like the middle one and the one on the right. Uh, the one on the left is something you see kind of outside the United States, at least my experience. But in particular, the, the one in the middle and the one on the right. Never allow, or anything that's called a banana block, never allow those to be used. I don't care what other cable suppliers tell you. I don't care what the block manufacturer tells you. These, uh, as I say, have caused damage to OPGW and ADSS uh, throughout my career. Um, they're really bad. I do think that my uh, other cable suppliers would also tell you the same thing. The reason for this is that when the cable passes over a block, it, there's a certain bearing surface that the cable is actually um, passing over. And that bearing surface you can look at from the center of the block as creating an angle that we call alpha in this illustration. If I keep the diameter of this shiv the same, but I use two of them, all I do is take that bearing surface and divide it over two, half to one block and half to the other block. So if that bearing surface isn't enough to carry the weight of the cable safely, then it's still not safe. And it doesn't matter if I use three blocks because then it's same bearing surface, over three or alpha over three. So it doesn't matter if I use 100 blocks, I can't get adequate bearing surface. And that's why ganging blocks doesn't work. You have to use a block of the proper diameter. Now, there's sort of an exception. I've seen some lattice towers where the design of the tower was such that you couldn't get a block at the center of the structure where you needed it that was of the adequate size. In that case, what you need is to have a block on one side of the structure that's an adequate size, and then a block on the other side of the structure that's an, an adequate size, and then let the cable pass through the center of the structure in that area that's too small to fit the block. That's okay, but again, the block diameter is the adequate size. Next up, after you've completed the stringing itself, you have to bring the cable up to sag and you have to clip it in. Those require additional tools. The grips that you need for sagging and clipping in, you've got basically three choices. Uh, as I say here, two good choices and one if you're really in a jam. The good choices are a pocketbook type come along, also called a coffin grip, and that's what you see in this first picture over here. You have a hinge on one side, some bolts on the other, and it, it, it opens up like the hinge of a door, and then you close it over the cable and tighten the bolts. Um, works great. These are kind of pricey. They cost about $400 each, and they take longer to get, typically two to four weeks, because they're for a specific diameter. So when you order them, the manufacturer has to take one out, and uh, machine the groove to the proper diameter. But these can be used indefinitely if you keep them in good condition. Formed wire grips are your second option, also called guy grips. These are cheap, uh, typically less than 50 bucks. They're often in stock. Um, they cover a, a range of diameters but their limitations are that you can only use one of these a maximum of three times. So you've got an initial application and two reapplies, and then you have to throw it in the scrap bin. Also, you have to be aware that some grip manufacturers don't approve the use of their uh, formed wire grips as a working tool. Their argument is they've designed this to be a dead end, not to be a tool, and you're using it as a tool. 
So if you do that, you're kind of taking the liability upon yourself because they'll say that if something goes wrong, it's not their problem, it's your problem. Usually, if a project is over about maybe 15 to 20,000 feet-ish, it's actually more economical to use the pocketbook grip. You've just got to factor in that lead time, right? Because you're having to throw some of these away. Usually, the crossover point is somewhere in that range where it's actually going to be economical, more economical to use the pocketbook type grip anyway, even though these individually are inexpensive. When you're in a pinch, you can actually use a dead end as a tool. Uh, a bolted dead end, the problem with using that is that those have shear head bolts on them. So after you've used it and sheared the bolts off, you'll either have to buy new bolts or be sure to use a torque wrench to um, get them to the proper torque. If you used a U-bolt, sometimes called a wedge type dead end, uh, that can be more difficult to move after you've completed the sagging or you're clipping in. So that's the disadvantage of trying to use that. Um, the formed wire uh, type dead end, so I'm, like an OPGW formed wire dead end with two layers of rod, that's going to be difficult to take off. Um, and you can't then use it again as a dead end after you've used it as a tool. So if you've used a formed wire OPGW dead end as a working tool, you can't then use it as a permanent dead end the way it was originally designed. So if you're in a pinch, these are some workarounds, but as I say, you need to be in a pinch to try to do that. There are some bad grips, just like there are bad blocks. And these are some pictures of things to never use. So on the left, you have what people will call a pork chop grip or sometimes a Chicago grip and don't use it. Uh, here's another variation of that theme. And the reason is the shape of the groove. So the groove here is typically either elliptical, which is gonna tend to flatten a cable when it's used or triangular, which is just going to grossly deform the cable when used. Um, neither of those are good. Don't use them. You need to use grips that are specifically designed for use on OPGW or round cables that keep that make sure they stay round. Now, we talked about an anti-rotation in passing before an anti-rotation device, I should say, in passing before. When do you need to use that? Now. Some suppliers always require that you use an anti-rotation device on all of their cables all of the time. The manufacturers in general, when an anti-rotation device are required, they will have different dimensions and weights. So you have to check. If you're using in-cab cable, our guidelines are, for our aluminum pipe type cable, you do always need to use an anti-rotation device. Uh, and we will help make sure that the weight and dimensions are correct. I'll show you a typical one in a minute. For a center tube type cable, you don't have to use an anti-rotation device until the pulling distance exceeds 15,000 feet. So up to 14,999 feet, you don't have to use an anti-rotation device, but at 15,001 feet, you do. For a stranded stainless steel loose tube type design, anti-rotation device not required. Now, you can use an anti-rotation device when it's not required. That's OK. But obviously, the opposite is not OK. So if an anti-rotation device is required and you don't use it, that's going to be a problem. But if it's not required, you can use it. That will not be a problem. Uh, this is a typical one. You could fabricate it uh, in the field with some chain. You can get the dimensions here. In some cable designs, as the cable gets larger, we might have you increase the weight a little bit, but the dimensions are here. Uh, these are also in our installation instructions, and this is just a typical one. There are commercially available ones that are available, so you can buy. For example, Slingco has one. That's fine to use, too.
again, contact the cable manufacturer. Uh, they should help you in making sure that you're using an anti-rotation device that's proper for the cable that you're trying to get installed. Now, pole setup. We talked about this at the very beginning, but I didn't give you any detail. When you set up your cable reel and your bull wheel tensioner, you have to have a certain rise over run. Excuse me, I did that opposite. A certain run for a certain rise. Uh, NCAP allows one to one. So if this is 100 feet, this can also be 100 feet. But some suppliers require more run relative to the height. So uh, they might require, if this is 100 feet, they might require that you be 300 feet or 400 feet distance. Um, we allow one to one. The thinking is basically this is like a 45 degree angle, not a big deal. If you're finding that the cable is bouncing, what you could do is drop the, uh, the cable reel, excuse me, the shiv. Uh, that might help with that if that's happening, but this has worked well for us. Um, with somebody else's cable, that uh, lowering that first shiv is potentially another option if you don't have the physical space. You know, 300 feet is a football field, so that's a lot of space to try to take up. But again, in the category of you need to check what the manufacturer is allowing. Pulling speed. So, again, these are general guidelines. In the field, the principle to keep in mind is that the pull needs to go smoothly. The cable, particularly, needs to pass smoothly through the box. Remember, I said I'm going to use the word smoothly like a thousand times in this presentation. So, I'm trying to use smoothly as many times as I can just on this one slide to emphasize the point that the pull needs to go smoothly. If you're using an ARD, you're gonna to need to go more slowly. Around one to three miles per hour is a good guideline. You're also gonna to need to slow down at each structure to make sure that the ARD passes through the block smoothly and then clears it. Uh, once it's completely cleared the block, then you can smoothly accelerate and continue the pull. If you're not using an ARD, an ARD, then you can go about three to five miles an hour. Now, you might be tempted to go faster than that, but I'm gonna remind you that old saying, slow and steady wins the race. So keep it slow, keep it smooth. If you're um, having issues during the pull, like the chatter or something, slow down. Also, again, when you uh, start and stop, don't jackrabbit that start. You know, go from zero to five miles an hour in two seconds. Instead, ramp up the speed smoothly. You're, if, if you've got a lot of angles or the terrain is rugged or the weather is bad, you might have to use a slower speed. Again, keep it smooth. Uh, Customers will ask for temperature and time limits, like how long do you have to complete sagging and what kind of temperatures can I install in? These are general guidelines and I'll explain the reason for them in a minute or as we go along. So the temperature range for stringing minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit to 122 degrees Fahrenheit, which minus 30 C to 50 C. Uh, some cable manufacturers might allow a little bit less. Some may allow a little bit more. Why in the world anybody would be, would be out trying to install cable uh, lower than minus 22 Fahrenheit beats me. I guess maybe an emergency situation. If it's much colder than this, this again is like a yellow flag to talk to the cable manufacturer because when things get cold, they get kind of they tend to get kind of brittle and bad things can happen, but you can talk to the cable manufacturer and maybe get some ideas if you're in a pinch and which, of what you can do to mitigate the potential risk here. Um, so if you're in Alaska, give us a call. If you're in Saudi Arabia, um, heat doesn't tend to cause as many problems, but it can cause some. Again, give us a call, we'll help you out. But these are pretty good general guidelines uh, 
you know, here in the United States, we don't see too many people working outside these, except again, maybe on the cold side in Alaska. Sagging, you know, people, uh, I completed a poll and it's Friday afternoon and it's five o'clock, um, it's Miller time. Um, how long can I leave the cable before I bring it up to sag? And we say 18 hours, but really, it, 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 it's much better to bring the cable up to SAG and install the first and last dead ends and then go home. The reasons for that is twofold. One is that when the cable is not secured, it's vulnerable. Now, I know somebody will say, well, you know, we're going to tie it off. Well, but a tie off is certainly not as secure as a dead end. Secondly, um, even if you, uh, or what, what I say here is that leaving a cable in the blocks can distort the sagging process. And what it's going to do is the cable under its own weight will begin to elongate. So even if you allow the sag to be really high, that's still gonna happen because it's got the cable weight there. And really your stringing charts are based on the assumption that there isn't any cable elongation that's permanent. So once that starts to happen, meaning permanent cable elongation, you end up in a situation where you can get the sag correct, but the tension will actually be higher than what it was designed to be and what's shown on your stringing chart. Or you can get the tension correct, it'll be per your stringing chart, but the sag will actually be greater than what's on the chart. So you really don't wanna do that or allow that to happen. There are ways you can correct for it, but you gotta talk to the cable manufacturer and it's about half science and about half good guess. Uh, it is really better to do the sagging immediately. Uh, for clipping in, meaning in installing all the suspension clamps, uh, about 48 hours. Now, again, the cable is unsecured, so it's more vulnerable. Uh, and you should secure longer spans because if bad weather comes in, you know, like the Texas ice storm we had a few weeks ago, uh, the cable under load, wind or ice load, will tend to be pulled into the longer spans. And so you could have a situation where enough cable is pulled in so that the cable is violating code clearance. And if it's crossing a road, you know, that potentially is a safety hazard. Um, so what you could do is secure those longer spans if you can't do the clipping right away. Damper placement, people ask about that. We say no more than 24 hours after clipping in or 54 hours after sagging. But generally you're doing that in conjunction with clipping in. Usually this is not a problem, but I do need to point out that when the cable is first installed, the tension is higher. And that means that the cable is more vulnerable to aeolian vibration. So it really is important that you get those dampers on as quickly as possible. But these are some rough guidelines to go by. Again, contact us if you're in a pinch and can't go by them. Oops. And that completes today's presentation on stringing. And I will now be able to take questions. I can find questions. Bum, bum, bum. Let me do this. Here we go, Q and A. Uh, first question, will there be a downloadable video after the presentation? Yes, uh, you'll be sent a link. Uh, everybody who registered and attended will get an email with the link uh, for the video. Steel bar from crane and steel fork from forklift look alike. Uh, describe one over the other. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't fully understand the question. A forklift is fine, but you would just, with a forklift, you're always lifting from the bottom. That's the point, always from the bottom. Um, if you're using a crane, then you always use uh, an axle and a, a lifting bar. 
I mean, that's distills the rules down to those basic principles, and then you're okay. Those tight structure cable have different angle numbers. Tight structure is from another cable supplier. And yeah, they'll have their own requirements for their cable. Uh, I'm not able to speak to what my competitors do. Will the wedge type damage the fiber cable? No. Um, well, when I say that, uh, a U-bolt type dead end which is what I mean when I talk about a wedge type uh, dead end um, won't damage a cable. That's specifically to preform line products. There are some other clamps that are called wedge clamps that are used here and there. And uh, as long as it's a good one designed specifically for OPGW, uh, it should be fine. Uh, let's see. The restriction on total angle turn, is that the sum of all angles turned or do the left angles cancel out the right angles? A very good question. It's the sum of the absolute values of the angles, right? So if I've got 45 degrees to say the left and then 45 degrees to the right, it, they don't cancel each other out. That's a total of 90 degrees of horizontal line angle changes. So you ignore the direction and, as I say, add up the absolute value of the angles. Okay, okay. any other questions? I'll give it another minute or two. Okay, let's see. Forklift, do not lift or move the cable by the wheel hub. Yes, absolutely. A crane, do lift by the hub of the cable wheel. Aha, now I think I understand the concern there. Let me go back. In this picture, you are not lifting by the arbor hole that you would see in a wood reel. Instead, you would be lifting by, I need to find a quick picture of a metal reel. Hang on one second. What we're trying to illustrate with that figure is that you don't lift from the interior of this metal reel. So if you had a forklift where you had an attachment uh, to create an axle, I've, I've seen that. In fact, I think we have one that we use for moving small bobbins. Uh, we don't have one that would be used for lifting full reels. But if you had uh, such an attachment to create an axle, that would be okay, because that's the same as using a axle and a lifting bar. But what you don't wanna do is use your forks through this interior open space of the reel. So to the person asking the question, was it Jay, Jason? Did, did I answer your question? Hope. Back to Q&A. That I answered that question. Okay, uh, back to total, answered that. In my experience, what proper improper installation techniques have most commonly resulted in damaged fibers? And that has been blocks that are too small is number one. A close second is the banana blocks. A comment about the double shift does not improve the bearing, but does reduce the bending angle. Any comment? Uh, my comment is that the bearing is what the source of the problem is, and that the bending angle improvement is not enough to be of significant help, my, ex my experience. I, I've, seen, uh, I've seen the double type blocks or the banana blocks damage cable, and that's why we say don't use them. Um, so if you double shiv, the shiv the sh each shiv has to have the proper diameter, and then you're not gonna have a problem. So Jason Phillips, thanks for your question. I'm glad I was able to answer that uh, to your satisfaction. And uh, like 
we're at now 13 minutes past the hour. So we've got time, maybe one more question, if anybody has anything. Okay, and I'm not hearing anything. I appreciate everybody's time and attention today. I appreciate the questions, they help. And uh, I hope that I'll see all of you at a future webinar. If you have ideas or suggestions, uh, please do let us know. If you wanna get your continuing education credits, please look for the email link and follow the instructions, uh, take the test, pass the test, and you'll get your credit. And then we will also be sending a survey. So that's your opportunity to give us feedback on how good we did today, but also you know, thoughts about anything else you'd like to see us discuss. Uh, we're always open to your suggestions. Again, appreciate everybody's time and attention and hope that everybody has a great day and a great rest of the week. Take care now. Bye-bye.